Duff McKagan, welcome to Hard Talk. Thanks for having me here. Now tell us about that moment, and I suppose it was the moment that in a sense saved you when your pancreas just gave up. Well, um, yes, I, I kind of found myself uh, getting closer and closer to insanity as, as uh, my drinking got worse and the drug intake got worse. And um, I, I knew something would give. I, I, and I even got to a point, and the reason I sort of wrote this book was so many people have asked me about how did you get so bad? How much did you drink? How much drugs did you do? And, it, and if I were to tell you an amount, to a normal person, it would just sound like a huge number and it wouldn't mean anything. So I wrote about the kind of journey into my insanity. And um, fortunately for me, it, it, you know, my pancreas did go. I mean, or else I might have just drowned in, in, in vomit or something, you know, at some but point. You, but you nearly died. I mean, didn't you? I mean, yeah, in fact, yeah. you were begging the surgeon to kill you. It was so, the pain was so great. The reason I say thankfully it happened this way because it was a real, real wake-up call. And I was given morphine and Librium for the, the Librium was for the alcohol withdrawal, but, uh, uh, and the morphine was for the pain. But it was a gentle relapse off of alcohol. Right. And I was in the hospital for a couple of weeks and it gave me time in that hospital to really think about how I got there and how, how maybe some solutions coming up. And, and, Visions of, you know, I saw things in that hospital. My mom, I'm the last of eight kids. My, my mother coming in, she had Parkinson's. Her coming in and, and seeing her youngest son with tubes, um, running in and out of them. And I was on my deathbed and she has Parkinson's. And, and uh, I knew the order of things was absolutely wrong right then and there. And I, and I thought if nothing else, I'll, I'll, I will make it better for my mom. For her, you know, last years here, I will try to to, to rise to the occasion of being a good son to my mom. And that's really what started my whole upward swing. Okay, but th you talk about your pancreas exploding. We should explain that actually what happens inside you when that happens is, I mean, you described it as third degree burns on your internal organs. Yeah, what, what it felt like to me, I mean, it started as just kind of a, a, a small burning pain and I didn't know what it was, I just thought, you know, maybe I had some gas or something, and I was laying in bed, and, and the pain kind of spread, and I thought, well, the gas is just getting worse. And, and then it, it, it suddenly just went everywhere in my abdomen, and, and I couldn't move. And what I did know was the enzymes that digest your food had spilled out to the outside of my... And how do you recover from that? I mean, is it, is it you still feeling the effects of that now? No, 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 no. That, so that was uh, 17 years ago now. I know, but I mean, you, they cut out part of your pancreas. No, no, they didn't. So that was the, the miracle thing about mine. So your pancreas expands. Mine expanded to the size of like an American football. And it's, uh, the pancreas is not a, a large organ. And uh, it expanded and burst. Um, so they did an ultrasound. I was rushed to emergency. My friend found me in my bed. Uh, my best friend from childhood came over to the house, found me upstairs, and um, they took me to emergency. They shot, when, when they, I knew about the, the warm effects of opiates, and when they had the morphine in me and the pain didn't go away, that's when I knew I was in real trouble. They did an ultrasound. Um, my pancreas was huge. They, a surgeon came and said, we're gonna have to cut out part of your pancreas okay. and you'll be diabetic or dialysis sure. or whatever and I and that's when I asked I said just just kill me I mean the pain was so bad the morphine was okay. doing nothing for it and uh, um, it was very real at that moment everything that, that, was very real it happened you say, as you say because of your drinking and you say pe normal people just don't understand I mean the actual quantity that you describe you as drinking as as being well you moved on to wine 10 bottles of wine a day you, that's when I was trying to taper down yeah and that was, you swapped vodka for wine? A gallon of vodka, I went from a gallon of vodka, you know, give or take, many probably times give um, a gallon of vodka a day to, I'll, I'll go to wine, I'll try to taper off. And, but I was drinking, yeah, 10 yeah. bottles of and wine And this is all during the time you're in Guns N' Roses, I mean, we're talking about 
years of abuse. Well, th th yeah, especially um, there's a good two and a half, three years in there that was, was pretty brutal for me. I was, I was um, self-medicating panic attacks I'd had since my teenage years. And um, the thing is, you, you think, like for me, I thought, well, I'll deal with my panic attacks in a few months when I have time. Well, the band just kept picking up steam and picking up steam. And what I found out, and guess what, folks? Rarely do you get, life gets busy. You rarely do you get that time in a few months to deal with that thing that you're self-medicating right now. Okay. And, and I found that you know, booze could, could dampen down a, a panic attack really quick. And I found that out. Well, fairly let, early. Let, let's go back because uh, 1986, and, and you describe this in your book, um, It's So Easy and Other Lies, which yeah. is basically, I mean, it's an autobiography, but you describe how uh, one year, 1986, the, the band members of Guns N' Roses are in what, a one, re one room rented flat, just really no money, yeah. a pretty, I mean, they're a pretty abysmal life. Some, you're ransacking some of the girls who are sleeping with the guys, you're ransacking their handbags to, to, take, to take money. Some of you guys are selling drugs. It's a pretty low life for you. And yet within a year of that, you have this best-selling debut album of all time. Yeah. I mean, that change over a year must have been phenomenal. There is no, um, no how-to video or a how-to manual for what happens in your life when, when, a, when a record, like our first record, finally did take off. We were used to, we all played in bands before Guns N' Roses. We were used to doing like little punk rock tours and, and living sort of hand to mouth. Um, you know, it wasn't that abysmal to us. We were just living and we had our band and we believed in our band and it was exciting. We were young men, we were 20 years old, barely men, you know, barely. Not even men, really. Um, but we believed in our band, and uh, we, we finally got a record deal, and we made the record we wanted to make, and we toured and toured, and, and uh, about a year later, that record took off. And the well, change was, was, uh, was, was quite amazing. Well, let's have a reminder of one of the songs from that first album. Okay. Sweet Child of Mine, which was released actually in 1988, and that's at a time when what you're you're hiring private planes, 727s, to, to for your tours. Not yet, not yet. We just um, we, we eventually did. Um, 1988, when that single came out, Sweet Child, was finally when the record took off. Um, that single went to number one in America, and we were still living on the, in a tour bus, making a hundred dollars a week, and and then the record started really selling, and and um, we came off of that tour, and I, and I remember, remember my first check, the first big check that I got was $80,000, and it might as well have been a, a billion dollars, because I didn't know, and nor did my family that I grew up in, you know, uh, know anything about money. So I couldn't go to one of my older brothers and sisters and ask them, what do I do with 80 grand? And what's a stock, and what's a bond, and what's, you know, a savings account, really? What's, what's a mortgage? What's in a mortgage? Uh, what's a loan? I didn't know any of this stuff. So, um, but getting that 80 grand, you know, it was like just a windfall. Of course, you know, that was the, the beginning of a lot more checks to come. Okay, I mean, they were phenomenally successful. I wonder what you, when you hear that sweet child of mine now, and you think back to that time, what do you, how do you feel about it? Well, I hear that song a lot. It's, <laughs> it's a, that song's played a lot. So I, um, I, I don't spend a lot of time in, in my past, and I, with, I think going forward, you know, I, my life's always just going forward, and, and now I have daughters that are growing, they're 11 and 14, I write two columns a week, and I um, have a business, and I have a band that tours, so everything's so much in the present, and um, sitting down to, to, to write the stories that became this book, so the first time I really, like, took some time and, and evaluated my thing, my life, how I got to that hospital bed and how I got out and, and what happened to me and 
with Guns N' Roses and what happened to me with Velvet Revolver. And um, mm -hmm. I think we have these rear view mirrors in life, at least what I discovered. All the bad stuff that happened, you know, I, you just kind of peripherally think it's somebody else. It was all, always that other guy's mm -hmm. fault. And all the good stuff you had everything to do with. As I was writing this book, I found that maybe I had something to do with some of the bad stuff too. And some of that bad stuff. I mean, it's not just the drinking. It's also, there was also stuff that you were involved in. And one of the, you know, one of the charges that was leveled against the band uh, was, was a charge of misogyny, partly because of the first album cover, which was, oh, yeah. um, which was a, a picture. Robert, which, Robert Williams. Yeah, a picture of a robot standing over a, an assaulted woman. Yeah. Um, and she's exposed, she, you know, she, her, her knickers around her calves. Uh, and you were criticized for that, but also for the lyrics of It's So Easy, which you picked up with the title for your book. I mean, there's yeah. one, one line in it, uh, turn around, bitch, I got a use for you. I mean, when you look back at some of the stuff that you did then, are you guilty of misogyny? I wrote those lyrics for, for that song. So, I'll, I mean, you can come straight. It was, it was very much a tongue in cheek. Um, song not misogynistic in any way. Um, How do you explain it to your daughters? Because you've got teenage daughters now. Um, well, there, there's a spirit of, of rock and roll that, has, that is, to me, far and above uh, um, you know, misogyny or homophobia or any of those things. There's just like this primal sex and rock and roll are just um, hand in hand. And, and um, how would I explain it to my daughters? I, but don't you think it's, I mean, you take the, make the point when you're writing this book that you're responsible for some of the stuff. Isn't that spirit of rock and roll responsible and influencing people in the way that they see things? Um, I think I give humans a lot more credit than if, if something that I write, a song or a lyric or anything, if it influences them in a bad way, which I, I rarely ever hear about, you know, 99.99% .99 of the times people will come up to me and say, your music changed my life. It's always a positive thing. Um, there's maybe one or two instances, and it's usually something that happened at a concert, whether it was people pushing forward and somebody falling in the mud and drowning. That's way more brutal than me. That yeah. to me I mean, than you had to, two, two fans in 1988 were crushed to death yeah. at one of your concerts. But, but be, beyond that, I mean, as well as that, there was the lifestyle that you were leading. I mean, the influence you must have had on people, because part of this, and you said it fed into, to, we couldn't have made the music if it weren't in part, in part for what you were doing. I mean, I wonder what... What, what do you mean? Well, there was one point at which you talked about uh, we had to go out on the edge to get the songs we got. I think so. Yeah, I mean, you have to live. You can't just write a song and not... To me, for honest rock and roll, you can't imagine... Uh, especially the subjects we're talking about, cops and crime, especially the first record, it's all about the life that we so were the drink and the, the drugs were essential to the rock music? To our songs that, I'm not saying they're essential to rock music, period. They were essential to that record that we made in 1986 that came out in 87. And it was a record that spoke to an awful lot of people. And, and I wonder if you think if it influenced I them. think we were just being honest about what was going on around us. We were the, I think that's why it spoke to so many because there, what was on radio at that time in rock music was just sort of a lie. It was, it, was, it was sprinkled up pop rock music and it wasn't speaking to anybody. It was speaking to little girls who were going to the mall. And there was a whole rest of us who were out there that were living this real life. And, and if you remember, there was a recession that was in the early 80s and there was all these things that people my age lived through. And finally, we were this band. There was a lot of other bands like us that were speaking the truth. There was great punk rock bands and so on and so forth that were speaking the truth. And it wasn't like we were making a political statement or anything close to it. We just wrote honest songs about stuff we were going through. That it spoke to a lot of other people wasn't, did, were we trying to speak to a lot? We didn't think 10 people would buy our record, but a lot more than that bought our record. You know, I didn't okay. think. 
when you look at the price for that, there was a moment, and you describe it in 1991, where you find yourself in your walk-in closet with a gun, yeah. ready to sh basically ready to follow your, the, the guy you knew, Kurt Cobain, a few years before. Yeah. Um, well, we're mixing up a few different things. I mean, really, my, my addictions and, and so on and so forth had Guns N' Roses may, uh, my life in a, in a band that, was, that got huge um, didn't give me time to address my, my panic disorder, which was really the root of my whole drinking and self-medicating. So I don't want to confuse or certainly not blame Guns N' Roses or rock and roll or anything that silly for my addiction. My addiction is my addiction. Um, and um, it was something I had to come to terms with um, outside of rock and roll. So and you would have had the same addictions irrespective of the, the band and the success? Who knows? I, uh, the only life I know is the one I lived. You know, um, I know addicts, a, a lot of them, in, and, um, and in recovery that had wholly different experiences in life than I did. Completely different. Some that were stockbrokers and some that were very successful and still are and some that aren't, they were never successful and um, okay. who knows where addiction really comes from. Um, but it was, it was fascinating to read the account of how you got out of it because you know, the conventional route is via rehab and you didn't do that. I mean, you, it, was, it, it was mountain biking in a sense that yeah. first saved you. Yeah. And, and that, was, that was what, I mean, you, you shut yourself off in LA in your house on your own and you just rode a bike. Yeah and became obsessional about it. Well, I, I rode my bike because I, I mean, for the first few months I still had the shakes. And um, so riding the bike was the only thing. I didn't know anybody, I didn't know anybody sober. So I didn't have like, I didn't know anybody in those fellowships, those rooms we, we know about. I didn't, that I know about now, I, but I just didn't know anybody there. So I, all I knew was my, I had this bike and I rode it and I got this sort of you know, first it was like self-flagellation, like you see the, you know, the parades and the Catholic parades. I, I felt like I was that guy going up the hills, like kind of beating myself up a bit for, you know, failing my mom, some of my friends and, and those types of things, my family. And, uh, but it also made me, started to make me feel whole. I was drinking water. I was doing like really, I didn't drink water for like 10 years, literally. And uh, I started eating food as like, as fuel, like healthy food and, and um, reading books. I, 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 I watched a, a, doc, a Ken Burns documentary on the Civil War and got fascinated and started reading about the Civil War and just, I started reading. And you also walked down into your basement and came across some financial statements which you just didn't understand and were too embarrassed to ask somebody. And that in a way was a, was a sort of turning point for you because that set you off on this quest to understand finance, which is, you put in large part your life now it is it is a part of my life I, I um, so yeah I found these financial statements in my basement and I was 30 years old I was sober I was a I'd millionaire. made I'd, yes and um, I didn't know what a stock or a bond was I was too embarrassed to ask anybody else really and I, and I was I didn't trust a lot of people in my industry um, and I didn't have anybody to really go to, so I went to school. I went, I went and got into this class at a community college um, in which it covered financial statements. And so I could take the information I got at class one night and come straight home. And I would be in class like, oh, that's exactly what I'm looking for. And, and eventually in that first class, I brought a financial statement. I blacked out the numbers and I brought it to my, my professor. And I said, I'm, I'm just having a problem with these. And he goes, well, they are sort of misleading. These aren't like um, classic financial statements. They're a little misleading. We weren't blatantly ripped off, but there was um, commissions and things taken off places that I would never allow to happen now. But uh, I, I, as I matriculated through school, I got very interested in academia, got into a school eventually that I wanted to, Seattle U. And it, but I, I, even before, I mean, I didn't graduate high school. So getting into Seattle U, I had to jump through a bunch of academic hoops, like community college, junior college, mm -hmm. taking math, 
taking things to get myself to the level to get well, in there. Such that you're in a situation where your first Playboy column, because they approach you and you've got this Duffanomics in play, Playboy, and mm -hmm. you say, you refer to my love of academia, don't laugh, you love it. Yeah, I, I really do. I, I, um, I hope to continue at some point. And, you know, I, I was just, I'm, I've been in the UK for the last couple of weeks and I, I love to work out as we were talking. And we, I was in Oxford the other day and, and some guy tells me, there's a gym down the street. I, I saw a guy in gym clothes and I said, where's the gym? And he said, it's down the street. And he, it was the Oxford gym, Oxford University gym. And there I am on the campus working out in the gym. And um, I just love those places, those places of higher learning. Um, but my point is, I was in school taking math. I wasn't even in business school yet. And I started getting calls from my peers, um, fellow musicians, guys who are in my shoes, you know, who had made money, didn't know what it was, uh, what to do with it. You don't want to make money in your 20s and 30s and be broke at 45 because you didn't know how money worked. And, and also because, as you've said, the whole industry is set up for managers. They're not going to say to their rock bands, you've only got three years of productive life. Who's, what manager is going to say that to their artist? Because that artist will say, oh yeah, I've only got three years. Well, I'll find the manager who tells me I have 10 or 20. Right. So managers will just kind of shy away from that. You, you, you sort of referred to your luck. You, you're, you're in a situation now where you're healthy, you're clean, you turned your life around. There are others, people like Amy Winehouse, who didn't. Is there any way that somebody can be protected from and, and be saved, in a sense, stop what happened to her? No, you, got, you, you can't save anybody that's, that's in a place that, you know, a person who doesn't want to help themselves. You, there's nothing you can do for them. And anybody that was around somebody like Amy Winehouse, who maybe feels guilty or whatever at this point, or, or, or us placing blame on a manager or whoever, well, you shouldn't have allowed her to do that. She's going to do it. Those people, I will. But you I, yourself, when you describe your own managers, you say if someone entrusted with the care of the band had actually cared about the health of any of us, guns would have been pulled off the road and put into therapy years ago. <laughs> You, a lot of my, my book, it, I, I see the humor in the story, too. So um, uh, when, you, when you read the words, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, yeah, if a dialogue would have been started, perhaps, about, hey, guys, But they're think after about, the gold. You, what's that? You, see, you use the expression gold. They're after the gold. They're interested in the gold. We're making money right then. And there's a whole line of gigs coming up that's going to make those managers a lot more money. They're little less apt to, to maybe say, let's pull it off, let's pull it back, get you guys, maybe you guys can talk about getting healthy, duff, right. you know. So is there <clears throat> any chance that Guns N' Roses could, I mean, you've been in, nominated for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, any chance of a reunion? Um, is there any chance, there's always a chance of anything in this life. Um, there's a chance my daughter might think I'm not the nerdy dad that she thinks I am, Right now, in a year, she might think, my dad's cool. Um, so who knows? You know, I know in this life, you, you don't know what's going to happen. I don't Duff. know what's going to happen next month in my life. So, Duff McKagan, thank yeah. you for coming. Okay, on cool. Talk. Thanks. That was easy.